Let's move on to uh, some of the questions people asked since last time. Okay, let's find out what uh, people are interested in asking. And there were quite a few questions in common, so it's going to take a little while to go through all this. Uh, bear with me. Let's see if uh, you see your own comment there, and then you can criticize me and throw, you know, rotten tomatoes at me. In fact, that's how we start this. <laughs> Fellow says the following. He says. Uh, I have never seen a channel with a more polar opposite name. You know, rational science. You are a uh, glue eater <laughs> with no idea what, <laughs> what you are talking about and are in an insult uh, to all of science. I highly recommend deleting your content and or apologizing for disseminating false information. <laughs> loved it. Absolutely loved it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. We will be taken into consideration. I guess he was upset about something I said. I guess I don't know. <laughs> and another fellow along the same line, more or less, right? He says, you are absolutely correct with respect to black holes, right? That is why we have no electricity, lasers, nuclear power plants, nuclear bombs, computers, or molecules. Pure genius. Yeah, these uh, people uh, believe that uh, science is about Technology and technology is about science. They mix the two words. They think that science and technology are synonyms or one is related to the other. They're not. Okay, they're not. Uh, mathematics, the religion of mathematical physics is something else. They, they work together with uh, technology and they, when they invent something in technology, they get a Nobel Prize in so-called physics. Okay, and it's technology and they call it, you know, physics. No, technology has nothing to do with physics, uh, the science known as physics, okay? So that's why we have to define these terms. We have to find out what science is about. First, got to define science, then we have to define physics, okay? And neither of those two include technology, okay? Science has to do with rational explanations. You need to have a mechanism or, uh, in the case of philosophy, uh, you know, you have to explain uh, purposes and reasons uh, for someone. When you get to physics, you have to explain mechanisms, causes and mechanisms. That's what physics is. And uh, to explain causes and mechanisms, we cannot say that, oh, technology. No, technology has nothing to do at all with uh, physics. Uh, are we supposed to say that um, quantum mechanics is proven because computers uh, are around, you know, does, does the fact that we have computers, does that prove quantum mechanics? Well, the fact that uh, we have computers, does that prove that a particle can be at two places at once, which is the explanation that the mathematical physicists, so-called mathematical physicists, you know, math magicians, that's the explanation they give you. They say that a particle can be at two places at once. So does a computer prove the fact that we developed that we have a te this technology known as computer? Does that prove that a particle can be in two places at once? How about GPS? Does that prove that um, you know that time is a physical object that can be bent? Is that what GPS proves? So again, you know, this person uh, obviously went to some kind of monastery. That's where they taught him. And this is what he parrots. He just repeats it without knowing what he's saying. No, uh, technology does not prove theories, okay? Theories have nothing at all to do with technology. Theory, you have to explain the mechanism objectively so that we understand it. We, you want to tell me how a car works? You say, well, you know, the gas comes over here, goes through the pipe, goes to the carburetor and the uh, pistons and so on. Then you explain the mechanism. Do I believe that's the way it works? Well, someone else might have a different theory. He might say, well, no, it's, it's angels, it's spirits that go from the tank through the pipe all the way to the motor. And that's his theory. He believes in that angels do it or spirits do it. And this guy says, no, no, it's not. It's, it's the gas and, you know, okay. Different theories. You can believe whichever one you want. We just want to understand what each one has in his mind. This guy explains it with angels. The other guy explains it with gasoline. Others say energy. We don't know what that is, so I don't know which is better, the spirit or the energy. Which one is a better explanation? But that's where we're at today. So explanations of mechanisms have nothing at all to do with technology, with developing a gadget. Okay? The fact that you can pick up pins with a magnet, 
that's useful for technology. You can do a lot of stuff with that once you discover that uh, um, event, that uh, phenomenon. But that doesn't mean you know how to explain what, how the magnet actually did, how it pulled up every pin, you know, so-called field, right? You cannot explain what a field is or what's inside the field in that region of numbers. Okay, so someone says here, says, I thought the ether was the black stuff. Yeah, a lot of people confuse, uh, or they have different opinions, you can say, or different, you can say, assumptions. Some people assume that the white dots are the ether. Other people assume that the black stuff, you know, space and ether are synonyms. So they have these both versions, and you, you know, so you have to be careful about, you know, first you got to get from the ether is which one he favors so that you can follow his presentation. Some etherists believe or propose or uh, make an assumption, you know, a supposition that uh, space and ether are the same thing. Others think that it's just a bunch of particles within space. And yeah, if there are particles, then something has to give shape or back drop, you know, provide a backdrop, provide some background to each particle, contour it, and so on, and we need to identify what that black stuff is. And so, in that case, we call that space, and the ether are just the particles. So, yeah, we have this problem out there, and e every etherist has to tell the crowd. It's up to them to tell the crowd, right? They can't say, well, I don't know because I've never seen the ether, but let me tell you my theory. No, you can stick your theory up your nose hole, okay? We don't care about your theory. We need to know what you mean by ether. And if it's a physical object, draw it. Make an illustration, make a mock-up, make a statue, whatever, but bring something, something that has shape, put it in front of our eyes. And if it's a concept, define it, very simple. So you have to tell us if ether is a concept or an object. And if it's an object, illustrate it. If it's a concept, define it, very simple. And yeah, if you're gonna put it as an object and there's a backdrop, background, something giving it shape, you gotta tell us what that background is as well. Okay, uh, last week, uh, this uh, fellow says, ether must be composed of some form of object. Okay, fine. Uh, we call it particles, right? I'll simply refer to them as bits. Okay, bits, particles, same, same difference. They're all tiny bits of larger ether medium, of a larger ether medium. These bits are the smallest scales object. We don't care. You already said bits are particles. That's all you said. They are made of smaller, they are not made of smaller objects. Okay, so we don't care what the bits are made out of, but a bit is a particle. There you have it. All you said is what we've always understood for what the ether is. You, you haven't come up with anything new. So he went on ranting for quite a while. They're writing a long uh, message. And all he said is, the ether, what you've always said it is, Bill, a bunch of particles. See how easy it was? You didn't have to say all that stuff and that they move and that there's a distance between the particles and so on. We just need to know what the ether is. And ether is a concept. It's not a physical object. As you can see, the, it doesn't stand still because they're always, those particles are always vibrating, changing their distance with respect to each other constantly, that's the, that's the supposition, that's the assumption, okay, that ether is just a bunch of particles, and when they vibrate, uh, those are the waves that we call light, and okay? that's, that's what it's always been like that, since the day that they invented the word ether, which just means, you know, the, the air of the gods, it's what the uh, gods breathe, and uh, so, yeah, um, ether is not an object, because an object has to have shape, the ether is infinite, just like space is infinite, according to all these people, and there is no such thing as an infinite object. So yeah, you, you have to tell us what the ether is. Okay, and the guy uh, didn't like my answer, <laughs> so he said, so all I need is to define my terms and you would consider it to be rational. Well, yeah, you have to define, or if it's a concept, you have to define it. If it's an object, you have to draw it, you have to illustrate it. So it's one or the other. How are you gonna treat the ether? Are you gonna say it's a physical object like a table? You know, a table we don't define, we point to it so that the person understands the word table. We say that's a table, you know, we point to it. And uh, so that's what you gotta do with the ether if the ether is an object. We don't care what it's made out of, we don't care about the bits and particles and molecules and atoms it's made out of. None of that matters. You point to the whole shebang. You know, we don't say an elephant is a trillion atoms. 
because a table is also a trillion atoms, and so is a rock and a tree. So we don't define these words, uh, or we don't use these words to, to refer to what it's made out of. Okay, we point and say tree, and we refer to the whole thing. And when we point to a tree in physics, in physics, right, in physics, when you point to an object, that object is made of a single piece. There's no myriology, no little parts in, uh, or uh, what is it, uh, time pieces, you know, uh, moving. There's none of that. It's made out of a single piece that's standing still. You point to a tree and say, tree, that tree is made out of a single piece for, that, for the purposes of presenting the object. Okay? The table is made out of a single piece. The house is made out of a single piece. You are made of a single piece. You're not made of atoms. You're not made of molecules. You're not made of cells. You're made of a single piece when I say man or whatever I want to call you. you know, I can call you X. X is made out of a single piece in physics for the purposes of presenting an object. You don't say, well, it's a trillion atoms, and let me tell you what it's made out of and how it moves. No, no, no. We, uh, all objects are static objects. You point and name. That's it, period. Okay? So if someone defines an ether as a medium, medium meaning thing, object, okay? Medium is object. It's a synonym of object in physics. Suddenly you consider ethers as rational. Yeah, if... Uh, you, but no, uh, you can't define the ether as a medium because medium you point to. Define, you define concepts. Okay, so you got to decide again whether ether is an object or a concept. There's only two types of words in the entire dictionary. All words fit under concept all, or they fit under object. They can't fit in both ways. Either they have shape or they don't. That's how simple it is. So concepts we define, objects we point to. So you need to go to kindergarten physics to understand that, okay? You, you, you skip kindergarten, okay? And uh, so we define concepts, okay? So you, you have to tell us what your ether is. Is it concept or object? We don't care what it's made out of, okay? You keep changing the rules. I do. I thought I, I'm very consistent with my rules. I thought that it, I guess he's referring to mechanism when he says it, it needed to be object-based to be rational. Yeah, mechanism has to be object-based. If you're going to talk about a car, hopefully you have objects in front of you. You know, how a car works or how it moves, etc. You know, then you have to have, you're talking about a mechanism, right? And in that case, yeah, you need to point to some kind of object. You know, I'm not sure if you remove all objects in the universe, what's happening? What are you pointing to? What's happening? You know, what's there? What experiment are you going to run? What are you going to measure? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing there. So, yeah, when you explain a mechanism, you had better have objects and not concepts. You cannot say that, uh, let me explain energy. You know, there's nothing to explain in energy because energy is not an object. You cannot explain the mechanism of energy. Yeah. Okay, let me guess. Only acceptance of your electromagnetic rope hypothesis without question is rational. No, no, in science, we do not accept. Accept means belief means that you have knowledge, which is another word for belief, and we do not use belief in science. In science, we only explain, uh, as it relates to physics, we only explain mechanisms and causes. That's, that's physics, okay? And so we don't accept, you don't have to believe the theory. When you talk about belief, you go to church, you, you go to religion, okay? You step the line outside of uh, physics and now you're in religion so we don't care what you believe in it whether you accept it or not whether they convinced you you know whether you call it proof or knowledge none of that has anything to do with physics in physics objective explanation of a mechanism period we're not, or causes we're done that's where it ends okay um, a couple more issues here one fellow says let's see if we can get this up here uh, says uh, concept, an abstract idea. Well, that's a bad definition. You got to work on it a little more because uh, abstract is, con uh, you look it up, it's an adjective, it's it means conceptual. An idea, any conception. So all he said is concept is a conceptual conception. <laughs> so yeah, uh, uh, that's what happens when people just pull out a, a uh, definition out of the dictionary and just place it up there, they all, all they can do is copy and paste. And they didn't, never realized that the people who wrote those definitions to begin with did the same thing. 
they just said, well, what does it mean out there? Well, it means this, oh, okay, and, and let's put it as a definition in the dictionary. So yeah, all definitions in the dictionary, uh, the ones that relate to physics, the critical ones, not one is defined properly in any dictionary on planet Earth, okay? So we need to look at uh, all these words, okay, and find out if they, um, what, what the correct definition is. In other words, by correct, I mean what the rational definition is that we can use in physics consistently, rationally, scientifically. Right? And, but this guy did say something to, which is true, correct, and uh, rational. Energies and fields are abstract ideas, correct. Abstract ideas can't do damage to objects. Absolutely. You know, at least he learned something. Yeah, 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 concepts cannot interface with objects, with things, with media, right, mediums. Um, that's why uh, concepts are not part of physics, in the sense that you cannot use them as physical objects. Can't move concepts around. That's what this channel is about. Okay, here we have uh, one fellow, and he says the following. He says, um, Einstein said that speed can multiply mass. <laughs> Whatever that is supposed to be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it makes no sense, but let me tell you why it makes no sense. Because math has nothing to do with physics. And that's why the mathematicians you'll hear very often say that, well, we cannot put our language of mathematics into, uh, into the words that we use in ordinary speech, meaning physics. You know, we, we cannot put it into physics. That's what they mean. Yeah, because math has nothing to do with physics. Math is a description, quantitative description of how something moves. And physics is about explaining mechanisms. So one thing has really nothing to do with the other. We do not need any math, any equations, any numbers to explain a mechanism. If I ask you, how does a car work again? You know, you can explain, you know, how the gas goes all the way to the engine without using any math. I don't need to know quantities. I don't need to know how much gas has to go. I don't need any of that. I just say, look, the gas moves from here to there and it makes the engine work and we can go through the different parts of the engine. You do not need any math whatsoever. That's why math has nothing to do with physics. And that's the problem here. The problem here is that, uh, you know, the, these people say E equals MC squared. Okay, so E equals, what is that? That's a mathematical, you know, uh, equation. That's a, just a formula. And, you know, you say, well, let me translate that into physics. And that's what this fellow is referring to. You know, how do you multiply mass times velocity of light squared, you know, the times speed. And in physics, it makes no sense. It makes no sense to multiply speed times kilograms. Okay? Because none of those things have pertain to physics. They pertain only to math. And then you can play around with the units out there in math, but don't bring any of that into physics. It has nothing to do with trying to visualize the mechanism of what that represents in mathematical terms. Okay? Okay, uh, fellow says, again, throwing uh, rotten tomatoes in my face, says, you cherry pick comments. <laughs> you know very well and better than anyone where your hypothesis fails. Why not talk about that for an hour? Well, uh, do I cherry pick? Um, there is some amount of cherry picking because it's unavoidable. I mean, I get comments in Facebook, in Quora. I get comments from uh, YouTube, you know, from many sources even from Patreon. So I get comments and questions from different sources. You know, I can't handle all that in, in my uh, lectures. I try to answer the ones that I think are pertinent. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, I can't be accused of favoring uh, or cherry picking in favor of some people who already understand what I'm talking about here in general. Uh, in fact, I do the opposite. I usually put comments of people who do not understand, which is really 99% of the time, or who are offended by what they hear here. They say, oh, but that's not science. You're doing uh, semantics and blah, 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 you know, word salad. No, no. Uh, I put comments usually of people who are against this channel. So in that sense, you cannot accuse me of cherry picking. But there is some amount of cherry picking because I can't put all the comments I receive. That's one issue. The other one is, yeah, I... Uh, uh, usually I put comments or questions that are related to the subject matter at hand, but I cannot be accused of just favoring people who side with me. 
you know, it's the opposite usually. I, the comments I put are people who, who usually are against this channel, okay, who do not subscribe or to the ideas presented by this channel. Okay, and uh, so this file continues. He says, the ropes you describe without explaining evident mechanisms. I don't know what he's talking about because I explain all mechanisms. Maybe he hasn't been here long enough. Are resembling the lines of force that mathematicians describe. Yeah, but see, again, it shows this person doesn't understand. The word, the, the term lines of force, the word field, none of those two words belong in physics. They have nothing to do with science. Okay? There is no physical object called a line of force. There is no physical standalone object called field. Okay? But if you think otherwise, hey, very simple. Next time when we come to the conference, you bring a line of force and a field and put it there in the middle of the room so that we know what you're talking about. Okay? Bring a line of force. Uh, okay? when, once we see it, we say, okay, now we see what you're talking about. Okay? There's no such thing as a line of force. There's no such thing as field. But ropes, hey, ropes, we can show you ropes. Just go to the hardware store. Thread, also, it's a physical object. I can, here's a thread, okay? It's uh, my floss thread. Uh, I'll let you use it after I use it, okay? No problem. And uh, I hope you see that, okay? So there, there's the thread, okay? So thread is a physical object, okay? That's what we're saying. That's, that's what we're saying that uh, light is comprised of two twine threads, what part of that someone may not understand, I have no idea. It's straightforward. It says, you really owe this answer to many. Step up, buddy, and defend it. You are not quite rational when it comes to the issues above. Well, I don't know. Unless you tell me what, uh, what uh, you object to, what, um, part, what mechanism I did not explain, or what um, theory I did not explain, you know, what object I presented that is irrational. You know, those are the things you, you have to criticize, but, you know, I, I'm not a mind reader. I don't know what's going through your tiny little brain, okay? And here is the uh, same thought says, you say ropes don't touch, but in the case of magnetism, you contradict yourself, saying that the single strands that the jumping guy jumps when they cross have minute touch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, let me say it's a very good question, okay? It's a very good question, and uh, the answer is that on YouTube, on YouTube, I say that the ropes don't touch and the threads don't touch. That's on YouTube, okay? In the book, I say something different. I say they do have a tenuous touch, a friction, okay? And I explain the context, but for the purposes of YouTube, I cannot go into all those details Details because it's very complex. There's a lot of people who don't understand what Rutherford backscattering is or uh, neutron bombardment. They, they have no idea. So it's a little over the top for some of these people. I cannot just go in there and start talking about all these little exceptions okay, or all these scenarios where we do introduce touch. Okay? So for the purposes of YouTube only, we say they don't touch. And that, makes it, that simplifies it enormously. Your question is very well taken. It's good. It's a good question. We have addressed it, but it's in the book. And I will not uh, touch upon that in YouTube because it's just too complex. It, 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 you have to go through many different scenarios to answer your question. Okay. So do they touch uh, in the book that says yes. Okay. So you would have to read the book to understand what we're referring to, what, under what circumstances we uh, introduce the word touch. And for that, you need to define the word touch, which no one has ever defined. I'm sure you don't understand what the word touch means. So even you don't understand what you're asking. And again, we have to define the word touch so that everybody can use it uh, rationally, consistently, scientifically. So we have defined the word touch, and that's where we started. Okay? Before, you can cut across, hopefully when a at some point, they mean we call that touch, right? So, what does touch mean? That's that's what we had. That's where we had to start. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, same Paul. He continues. He says also the atoms which are connected to all atoms that are at the extremities of the magnet are also connected by a single magnetic strand. Uh, the rope that guy jumps. Okay, so he's saying there's a single strand that comes out of the atoms and it also comes out of the molecules. It comes out of the rope. 
Okay, we have two theories there, one where it comes out of the atom, the other one comes out of the rope, okay? Uh, there's two theories for, for how the thread comes out, okay? Uh, so you say that the atoms are connected to all atoms and also spin single magnetic threads at the extremities of the magnet. You are being irrational, Bill. Well, not quite, uh, and I'll show you that in a second. What is the mechanism that turns uh, the thread uh, in the rope and turns the rope into single threads. Okay, so let's answer this gentleman, and uh, it's not a full answer, but uh, I just want you to get the hang of it a little bit. Here it is, okay, and uh, I want you to watch this. It's going to show you how the thread comes out of a spinning serpentine. We have two atoms, and the threads come out from the rope here, okay? In this case, it's the theory of the rope. Now you have a whole bunch of atoms lined up, we call that a serpentine, they're all merged with each other, and as they spin, the threads come out, okay? The threads are going to come out of here, and a uh, current is the spinning of the entire serpentine, and you can see that matches what we have out there. What is the uh, field, the so-called field? It's a bunch of these threads that come out of, in this case, we have uh, did it with the rope, but they also come out of the atoms, maybe both, maybe one or the other, and that's what uh, forms this wall of threads that we call the field, okay? So it's a wall of threads, okay, that uh, essentially is uh, coming out of the same atoms of which that, that are made of these threads. And in the case of the rope, where we talk about um, magnetism, uh, the, the magnetic field being uh, threads that come out of the rope, we have that, that when they spin, the two uh, threads come out from the rope. In the case of the atoms, uh, they're all uh, bound together, they're all merged together when the uh, whole serpentine, the whole series of merged atoms, really molecules, when they spin, they spin the threads that make up uh, part of the um, atom, and they spin around. So that's where they come from. Are they still connected? Yes, in the case of atoms, in the case of uh, merged atoms or m merged molecules, actually, <clears throat> you know, they're already merged. So uh, the thread comes out of the atoms. Okay? And they come out and they spin because the atoms are spinning in situ at great speeds. And that throws the thread out. Does that mean that they get disconnected or that the rope is dead and it's uh, ripped or whatever? No, it just... They come out, they spin, and when the magnetism stops, they, come, they go back to where they were. That's more or less, in general terms, what we're trying to explain here. Again, all this is in detail in the book. That's all I can tell you. That's not a cue for you to buy the book. I'm just saying that we do have it explained in the book. It's not like I'm improvising here and say, well, let's see, how am I going to answer the question? No, we've already answered those questions in the book, but you know, you got to read the book if, if you want to understand the details of all those processes. Okay, here it says the fellow, same fellow, I think, I don't see how an atom can form in this model, nor do I see how it can keep together. If it was all intangible rows, why do they form clusters like atoms and not just go through each other? And if light is going through the ropes, why, not through the ropes, it's the rope itself that <laughs> spins in situ, it torques in situ, okay? Uh, why then, when they torque, it travels in a specific direction? No, it travels in two di opposite directions. In other words, the ends of the rope cause a thump on the atoms at the opposite ends. That's light. The thump into the atom. Why? Because the atom is made of those same ropes. So this issue of how did the uh, atoms uh, connect, there is no connection. Uh, to the rope, right? Uh, there is no connection. It's not bound or pasted on or linked or, you know, attached. No, the rope becomes the atom, okay? One strand becomes the um, uh, proton star, and the other one goes around and forms the electron shell. And when you have gazillions of threads coming from every atom in the universe, you can see your atom is a bundle that is a star with gazillions of threads, uh, you know, crisscrossing in the center of the atom, hydrogen atom to make it simple, and that's covered by a ball, a membrane, a balloon made of threads, 
which is the thread that curved around from every atom in the universe. So every atom in the universe is made from the thread that comes from every atom in the universe. Okay. Uh, here's the construction. Okay. Uh, so I don't know if it's beyond your capabilities, but there it is. You can see the electric thread moves through the center. It's going to form the, ele uh, uh, the proton. And then the magnetic thread loops around and forms the uh, uh, shell or the membrane, if you want to call it, or, you know, whatever. Um, and there you see, that's our atom. And so the atom, and there you see also the ropes end up the electron shell, what continues is the uh, electric thread. So the electric thread goes through the center. <clears throat> All the electric threads are going to form the proton star. And what encapsulates this whole thing is the magnetic threads from every atom in the universe that form this balloon, this shell, this uh, membrane that encapsulates the proton star. And when that atom expands and contracts doing its quantum jump, it torques the rope. Very simple, straightforward. This is kindergarten stuff, hopefully, for everybody. Okay, we're not talking about stuff that's out of this world. Mother Nature runs a very simple universe when it comes to physics. Uh, the math, that's complicated. You know, you got to take calculus and linear algebra and all that stuff, which I had to take in college, uh, is, has nothing to do with physics. None of that has anything to do with what Mother Nature uses. The language of uh, Mother Nature, the language of physics, is not what Galileo said. Galileo said math is the language of the universe. Absolutely not, Galileo. Not at all. The language of the universe is illustration. We illustrate because Mother Nature does not, never went to school. She doesn't, and Father, Father Universe neither. Um, you know, they never studied math. What they, what they do is move objects, one atom to another position or another location from frame to frame in a universal movie. Okay, so every atom just moves to a different location. That's all they do every day. They don't need any math for that. They don't need to understand math. They don't need to know numbers. They don't need to know relations between the circumference and the uh, diameter. They don't need to do any, they don't make those relations. All they do is move atoms from one place to another. That's the universe out there, okay? And that's physics. You can explain mechanism, how Mother Nature, Father Universe, how they run the universe. Illustration is the language of physics. Okay, a uh, fellow here has, says, has, I never said light was going through obstacles, okay? Uh, because we were talking about, you know, the fact that uh, light turns around corners. We were talking about the slit experiment specifically where uh, we shine a light on a needle not a slit, but a needle, okay? And what happens is, you know, we have these fringes on, on uh, behind the needle. We don't need the slits. We can do it with a needle. And the problem there is, you know, how do you get particles to turn a corner? That's the issue. And this, uh, this is the second or third time now this fellow doesn't answer that question. And he says, I never said light was going through obstacles, okay? No, he did not say that. I said that, and I put those words in his mouth. I want to clarify that. Uh, it was me who put those words in his mouth. Why? Because he proposes particles, and you cannot produce that Poisson uh, spot. There you see, there, take the Poisson spot experiment. Where did I say light was going through? Right, he did not say that. I said that. I said that the only way he can explain it with particles is this way. If he goes right through the needle with particles, then we can make, if we can achieve this, which is unachievable, by the way, but assuming we could achieve that, that's the only way we can explain how that little tiny spot is made in the center, uh, called the Poisson spot, uh, in the center of that, um, that uh, image, right, on the right, the pink one there. Okay, so the only way you can do it with particles is going straight, okay? That's if you could achieve it, which is impossible anyways. What does this guy propose? Well, this fellow proposes something else. He says, you know, the particles that uh, create that little spot in there are the ones that turn the corner in the circular needle, you know, because the edges of the needle are curved. Well, this guy doesn't know the first thing about physics. Uh, I guess he's never tried this uh, anywhere in, in his life, you know, like uh, the particles are going to bounce uh, from the edges of that needle and go outwards like, you, like I show there with the red, reddish uh, particles. They're going to go outwards, not inwards. And this guy just has them coming inward, and he says that 
This is due to to the uh, reflect the law of reflection, whatever that is. You know, we, we have no idea what this law of reflection that he was taught at the monastery is. Yeah. Uh, so the only way, so I I did put the words in his mouth because I'm saying the only way he can explain with particles is this way. If the particles go straight right through the the needle, then he can maybe somehow explain how that little spot was made there. If instead uh, we go with his irrationality, which is hitting the edge of the needle and bouncing inwards, well, that process he's going to have to explain. You know, they don't bounce inwards, they bounce outwards. So where did he get the idea that the particles, discrete particles that are going to uh, go inwards? You know, they hit the, the uh, edges of the, uh, of the obstacle there and go inwards? No way. And you can do it with a rope. There you can see the ropes uh, in that middle or the, the one in the center there uh, that I put in there. You see the ropes coming to the edge of the obstacle. In this case, uh, we're going to say that's the needle, right? Portion of the needle. And uh, it touches, in other words, it, it, it is connected to the atom that's right there at the edge of the needle, on both ends of the needle, at both uh, extremes of the needle. And from there, another rope that is connected from that atom to the wall, right, is the one that makes the little spot there. And how does that work? Well, the, you have all these ropes coming from the edge of the needle or the spot or whatever you put there as an obstacle, and they're all um, synchronized in such a way they have to be at the precise distance, right, so that all the ropes are um, matching. In other words, that the... Uh, 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 what is it, the threads uh, of the rope match. In other words, green has to match with green and orange has to match with orange for, for there to be a spot. If you move that a little differently, you won't get a Poisson spot. You will only get it if all the ropes match. That, uh, you know, they're, they're coming from the same source, by the way. That's light there. That's uh, taking the torsions to the wall. And what you're staring at there is that all the ropes are uh, synchronized. They're, they're all at the same. The, the last link in all these ropes matches. Okay, They're not offset by half a link. That's the point. That's how you make that uh, little spot there. And uh, you can't do it with waves, even though wave is the proper uh, mechanism. Wave is the wrong object. There is no such thing as a wave, a transverse wave. What, you, what those are are just vectors. Those are mathematical vectors. They have no place in science, let alone in physics. Okay, so we're talking about a physical object called a thread, not a field. Okay, there is no such thing as a field or as a vector, not in physics. That's mathematics. Okay, and so th this fellow says the point in the middle comes from a few inward reflected light rays. Yeah, that's how, what we need for you to explain. Okay, you need to explain because he's talking about reflection. Reflection is bouncing. Bouncing, it's going to bounce outwards, not inwards. So this is what this fellow doesn't understand. And this is the third time now. And he th says he's a rational individual. He's not. Okay, here. Let me show you what happens when you throw a ball against a tree. Let's see if it bounces inwards. Okay, here it is. Okay. Hits. Where does it go? Does it go inwards like that? Try it at home, you know, find a tree, throw a ball to the edge of the tree, and you'll find that this is what happens. Outwards. That's what a ball will do. It will never bounce inwards. So that's the process we want you to explain. Okay, and this uh, fellow, you know, he, he uh, says it's rational. It's, uh, it's a rational mechanism that he's proposing. No, it's the most idiotic thing that you could propose. Okay, throw a ball against the edge of a tree and see if it bounces inwards. Film it and bring it to us. We, we want to see that. Okay? Don't cheat. Okay, so here it is. He said, the law of reflection is not just a mathematical law. Yeah? Uh, that's whatever it is. Yeah, the, the, part, the law part belongs to math. The reflection part, that's a physical issue. So, again, law of reflection means they're going to try to merge math with physics. That can never happen. They have laws in mathematics. We have no laws in physics. Okay, law means we have an equation or something. Okay? There is no such thing as a law in physics or in science for that matter. Laws belong completely to uh, mathematics. Law means that they convinced you of something. And that you follow the law, you believe it, you 
you know it, meaning you have a strong belief. That's what knowledge means, okay? So, uh, yeah, but anyways, uh, that's just a description to say the law of reflection. What does he mean by that? I mean, what does that mean? The important thing is that light reflects. Yeah, reflects means it bounces. And when you throw a ball against the edge of a needle, against the edge of a tree, telephone post, whatever you want to use there right, as an obstacle, it'll bounce outwards, never inwards. Okay, so what you need to explain, let's see if you got it, bean brain, okay? Inwards, show us how the ball comes inwards. Okay, that's the issue. Okay, so I don't know how else to explain it. This is the third time now, guy. As for bending around corners, as usual, you don't listen. Okay, I'm not listening, okay? I said apparent bending. Okay, that's irrelevant. But light doesn't bend. Irrelevant, okay? It's still reflected, even if you don't understand how. That's what we want to understand. We want to understand how, if you can explain how. <laughs> to show us how a ball bounces inwards when you throw it against the edge of a tree. That's what we need to, for you to explain. And don't tell me the law of reflection. You know nothing about law of reflection. Okay. So, I don't know, you got all these people there, they, 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 they all think they're uh, experts in math and uh, physics, especially in physics, you know, they, and they haven't taken kindergarten physics, but they know it all. Okay, um, oh, hold it. Okay, so here we have uh, this fellow, and he ends his dissertation, and this is where you need a beer. <laughs> He says, as for light particles, he's going to propose particles, right? Light does, does somewhat behave as particles, but I don't believe they are the kind of particles many believe in. Particles is particles is particles. I mean, we're talking about core puzzles. You want to make them round, you want to make them cubic, triangular, we don't care. Particles is particles is particles. Okay, so don't tell me that they're not the particles that everybody thinks. Of. I don't, show us your particle. What kind of particles are you inventing? Are they round? Are they cubic? Are they, you know, what are they, uh, uh, tesseract-like? Uh, I mean, I don't know. You're the guy who's giving the presentation. you got to tell. You can't say they're particles, but they're not the particles that everybody thinks about. Well, I don't know what other particles there are. You know, particles are always round things. If they're not round, then you have to say, well, they're cubic or they're T-shaped or whatever. You have to tell us when you talk about particles. And they don't understand that the objects is what, where they all fail. They all fail in the objects. That's why they propose ether. That's why they propose particles. Because they say, well, particles, you know what I mean. And they continue. No, no, you got, you got to tell us what these particles are. What, what encapsulates them? What is the backdrop? Is it space? You know, uh, what gives shape to each particle? You got to go through all that whole process. Spend two years on your assumptions and two seconds on your ir irrelevant theory. Because... For sure, it's irrelevant. They are not spherical beads. So he tells us what it ain't. He never tells us what it is. Just like the ether is and all these other people. They tell us what it ain't, never what it is. We need to know what it is. <laughs> Don't tell us that we're wrong. We know we're wrong. We, we concede. <laughs> I concede. I don't, under, I don't know, okay? I concede. Tell us. You tell us. You're the guy giving the presentation for ether, for plasma, for particles, you're the guy who t has to tell us what you mean by those words. And I don't know how to get that across to these people. They always skip that step. They say, well, you got it wrong, Bill. Yeah, no, I, I always have it wrong. Just tell us what is right. <laughs> uh, and then they tell you, you know, to add on, and they say, well, the reason I can't tell, I've never seen the ether. I've never seen, uh, you know, these particles. Uh, I don't have good eyesight. I don't know how to draw very well. You know, they come up with all this idiocy, this nonsense. You're giving the presentation, you have to visualize it. I don't care if you saw it or not, you have to visualize it and make them visible for us so we know what's in your, on your mind. We need to look inside your minds to see what mechanism you propose. We can't get to the law of reflection until we know what you mean by particle. And this guy hasn't told us what he means by particle. He said, well, and you know what a particle is, but it's not the particle everybody else has out there. It's a different kind of particle. And... So we have no idea what he's talking about. And then he said, the particles don't have a specific structure or size. So uh, they don't have size. A particle that doesn't have size, that's great, you know. And they don't have structure, and that's great too. I mean, no structure or size, but it's a particle. 
So again, he's, he's moving concepts around. He's saying it's a nothing that moves around. It's a zero dimensional nothing, no size, no shape, no nothing. And that's what I'm going to do my magic with. Yeah, and then uh, he adds, he says, you won't find a more rational explanation for light on YouTube. <laughs> My poor God. <laughs> Are these people for real? I mean, come on. Okay, so I think it's the same guy. He continues, he says, light interference does not exist. Okay, ever notice how two beams of light do not affect each other? Yeah, he's totally right there. You know, you cross two... Uh, laser pointers or two flashlights and you know there are no particles jumping around like if you took two uh, showers, uh, shower caps, you know, uh, shower um, uh, sprayers, you know, and you move them around the, the, or you take two hoses of water, right, and you move them across, you'll find, you know, water molecules jumping out of there. They're, they're going to hit each other. They don't go through each other. They, they bounce. Okay, so if you take two hoses and go like that, you know, cross them, uh, you will find that uh, water does bounce. You know, water hits water. Molecule hits molecule. That doesn't happen with light. You can take two, um, two flashlights or two um, uh, laser pointers, and they will not interfere. Even though there's a, uh, I can't remember, Burke. That's, uh, look up Burke, and these people say they've proven that the uh, uh, particles of light hit particles of light, and then they create, what? Virtual particles. So they introduced this virtual particle for their paper to explain how particles of light actually bounce against particles of light. And they do it with all virtual particles, which is an idiotic particle invented by quantum to explain the unexplainable. Okay? But other than that, for rational people, you know, other than Burke and his group, uh, yeah, uh, light does not interfere with light. Okay? They go right through each other. So he asks, ever notice that? Well, he says, they just go through each other. In, in that case, how could light interfere with itself? It's illogical. Well, no, it ain't. It's just that you never were smart enough to figure it out, what the magic trick is. Yeah, it's like, uh, you go see the... Magician cut the lady in half, and the guy says, well, that's un you cannot explain that. And the mathematician says, yeah, sure, I can explain it. You know, in this universe, the lady comes out in one piece. But in another universe, she was cut in half, and they took her to the hospital and or to the morgue. <laughs> okay, so let's explain to this guy how we do it with a rope model, how light does uh, interfere uh, constructively and destructively uh, with ropes. You cannot explain this either with waves, okay, transverse waves, because wave is not a physical object. That's why you cannot explain it with waves. What is a wave made of? Two fields. Fields are not physical object. Fields are a bunch of vectors, so that's the end of the wave. There is no such thing as a wave, a transverse wave, okay? The famous, you know, uh, perpendicular uh, electric magnetic wave, no such monster in physics. That's irrationality of mathematics. Okay, so how do we do it here? And uh, you do have to pay attention now. We have to, we're going to go very slowly here because not everybody can visualize what I'm going to show you here. Okay, so let's, let's go slowly. Okay, here it is. What do we show on the top? On the top, we see two ropes converging upon a black atom, okay? That's the one on the top on the left, left, upper uh, left, okay? And you can see that um, the atom is not pumping very uh, wide, very big. It's just very tiny, right? It's below the visible range. Why is that so? Well, because the frequency on the ropes, the number of links and the number of... Um, uh, you know, uh, the fact that it, it, the, uh, the ropes are not torquing very fast. That's, that's essentially it, okay? So it doesn't matter whether the ropes match, in other words, red with red or blue with blue versus not match, you know, red with blue and blue with uh, red because the frequency is very low. And so the atom is not pumping very widely, okay? And so that atom sends a signal through a rope to an atom in your eye. That's the one on the right. The black one on the right is the atom in your eye. 
Okay, so you can see it's low frequency, it's below the frequency, the visible range, and that's why you see a shadow or a dark spot or whatever. You don't see any light. Okay, that's what happens before turning on the light. Now we're going to turn the light on. What does that mean? Turning the light on means you're going to increase the frequency on the rope. That means now there are more, uh, the torsion is, has increased. The rope is spinning much faster now. And what happens is now you have more links per unit length. Now it brings it into the visible range. What does that mean? It means the atom is now pumping much higher, okay, much wider, and sends that signal to your eye with a higher frequency. You have more links per unit uh, length. Okay? That's what you have there. That's the bright band. Why don't we see the dark band? Why is it dark? Well, it's the same signal, but it's a parallel signal, and that's seen on another rope, okay, another set of ropes. And what happens here, they're not matched, they're not synchronized. You have red with, black, uh, with blue and blue with red. And so while one rope is trying to make the atom expand, the other one does not allow it, the, the other one forces it to contract. So the atom is not expanding as much as in the bright band. It just expands a little bit, and that's below the visible range. And that's the signal it sends to the atom on the right black, which is in your eye. Okay. So what we're seeing here is you, uh, the bright bands that we see on the wall are because you have higher frequency, meaning more links per unit length. And the dark band means it's below the visible range because one rope is offset by half a link from the other rope. And so uh, while one is uh, telling the atom to expand, the other one is telling it to contract. And so the atom is essentially pumping at the same speed it was before. That's in general the mechanism that we propose. Okay? And here we're going to see those some ropes head on. Okay? So now we're staring directly at the rope as it comes into your eye. In the case uh, that you have above, the one on the top, right? Both ropes are um, you know, red with red and blue with blue. So the torsion is enhanced and we have constructive interference. What happens on the bottom? Well, you can see that uh, red does not match with blue and blue does not match with red. And what happens is you know, one is telling the atom to expand, the other one's telling it to contract. And so that's the difference in, uh, in what happens to the atom that's in your eye. So in one case, the atom in your eye is uh, expanding uh, and contracting. And again, we do this at the atomic level. We don't explain it at the molecular level because it's a much more com complicated process. And also, we're going to be talking about cells taking the signal all the way to your brain and that kind of thing. Uh, we're, we're not going to get into that. We just want to show you the mechanism, the general mechanism of physics. We're saying that in one case, the atom expands uh, much wider, and in the other, it doesn't. Okay? And that's the difference between constructive interference on the top and destructive interference on the bottom. So yes, we can explain it with a mechanism, a physical mechanism, and it uh, gives us more confidence that we're talking about a rope. A rope can be a mediator for light. Particles cannot and waves cannot. What they've been using for the last 400 years, uh, since the days of uh, Robert Hooke, who came up with the wave nature of light first, in his book, Micrographia, 1665, he wrote about it because he studied it through the microscope, and he says, I see some waves where I see light, and I think light is some kind of wave phenomena. And in that sense, he was at least right. He had, it was a good start. Okay? Yeah, wave phenomena, but then they mathematized it and came up with, you know, you have Maxwell and so on primarily Maxwell, uh, saying that, you know, giving numbers to all these things when we didn't need numbers at all. We just needed to see the object. What object are you talking about? And Maxwell just said, oh, a bunch of vectors. Well, that's not an object. Okay, uh, we had another issue, also kind of important. Okay, here it is. And I showed this, that a magnetic field sucks uh, smoke. What I didn't tell the people and I did that purposely, is that we, it's a rotating magnetic field. And I thought that was irrelevant, 
I just said that a magnetic field attracts smoke. And the guys said, well, there's something going on there. Yeah, something is going on there. I didn't want to tell you about it because that was irrelevant to my uh, lecture. The, the point that I was trying to make is that a magnetic field has a way of affecting smoke. Whether it rotates, stands on its head, or jumps around, we don't care. We're just saying that a magnetic field has the ability to affect smoke, like you see there. Okay? And so all these guys, you know, went up in uh, arms. <laughs> they didn't like my, my, uh, <laughs> my pictorial representation of how a magnetic field sucks uh, smoke. So they came up and said the following. They said, magnetic field does not attract smoke. And the other fellow says, the, uh, that, referring to the magnetic uh, field attracting smoke, right? That obviously has nothing to do with magnetism. <laughs> so they don't believe uh, that uh, magnetic field has any way of affecting, uh, you know, smoke. Uh, so what is smoke? Well, what is smoke is a bunch of molecules. Smoke is a gas. It's just a bunch of molecules there, and we're saying that a magnetic field, which you cannot see, right? Because actually it's a bunch of threads that make up the magnetic field. Those threads are spinning at great speeds, and it's those threads, the intangible threads, right, that somehow come in contact with the molecules of smoke of this gas. And they, they can't they say it's impossible. You know, a magnetic field cannot touch smoke, cannot touch gas. And so I'm just going to make that case right now. First thing we have to make sure is that we understand that, yeah, exactly, field is a concept. So you cannot say that a field uh, touches smoke or does something to smoke. Fields cannot. Field is a concept. And no, I'm not doing word salad. I'm not doing semantics. It's called science. It's called physics. You need to use the right language. You cannot use the word lines of force and you cannot use the word field to talk about physical interaction those are not physical objects they are uh, concepts and anyone who uses a concept to move a physical object is known as an irrational individual so anyone using the word field in physics or the word line of force in physics is an irrational individual he has not understood the language of physics okay and yeah, you call it semantics, you call it word salad, whatever you want to call it. It's called science, it's called physics. Field is a concept, so you cannot use it as a, an object. Concepts have no way of interacting with objects. It is irrational to say that a field touches the molecules that comprise smoke. No, field cannot, because field, first of all, is infinite. Remember, the mathematical field it extends beyond space time. Every field does. Magnetic field, electric field, uh, gravitational field, all extend infinitely. So you cannot say the field is an infinite thing affects this thing right here, right in front of me. Now, if it's infinite, you cannot say. you got to look at the shape of this field, and of course a field has no shape because it's a concept. See how easy it was? You cannot say that love moves mountains. Okay? A thread, on the other hand, yeah, here's a thread again. Am I uh, floss? <laughs> thread. <laughs> uh, I will let you use it afterwards, don't worry, uh, is an object. That's a thing. Okay? That, that's a thing. Being objects, these threads have the ability to interact with matter under certain circumstances. And that's what we're going to uh, show right now very quickly. I'm going to run through these. Uh, you can look at them later on. So I'm just going to run them relatively quickly. Here's the first one. These are all papers, published papers, most of them at least. Okay, here it is. Uh, this one says rotating magnetic field on hydrogen production and water. So this one says, this paper, if you can look it up there, you can read it, uh, says that a rotating magnetic field, meaning the rotating threads, because there's no such thing as a field, okay, rotating threads can affect what? water and um, hydrogen. Okay, so that's what this paper is about. You can look it up. Here's another one, just so you can see, okay. This one says that wind generated, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, essentially, they're saying that a magnetic field, rotating magnetic field, essentially, right? I'm not going to repeat that constantly. But uh, the threads, rotating threads, affect wind, affect air, okay? What is air? It's a gas. So if it affects a gas such as air, well, probably it affects smoke, which is another gas. Why not? Here's another one, says the same thing, says that a magnetic field changes wind, 
Okay, it, it interacts with wind, it affects wind, and wind is a, air really is a gas, okay? Uh, wind is moving air. So yeah, it does affect, it changes, it interacts with the molecules. Okay, here's another one. And again, you can look these up later on. Okay, Earth's magnetic field extends several tens of thousands of kilometers into space. What does it do? It, uh, it uh, protects us against the solar wind. What is the solar wind? Is it uh, some kind of air, molecules, whatever? Well, it's a stream of charged particles. That's how they define it. In other words, we're talking about particles, probably atoms, okay? Maybe molecules, some molecule. The point is you have a magnetic field that interacts with molecules, with atoms. That's the point of that one, okay? So yes, uh, uh, magnetic fields, as they're known, meaning the threads that are spinning around in that region, they do uh, interact with molecules and with atoms. That's what I'm trying to say here. Here's another one. This one talks about affecting gases of a galaxy. Okay, so uh, you can look that one up as well, and you'll find out that a magnetic field has the ability to affect gases in uh, galactic gases at the galactic level. So it's not like, uh, you know, I've invented anything new. This is all in the literature, okay? So to say that a magnetic field has no way of affecting smoke, well, uh, think again, okay? Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that what this other fellow said is, un, uh, is completely uh, out of the, uh, out of mind, out of body, you know? It could be that the field, you know, the threads that are moving in there, swinging around, they're moving the air first. And by removing the air, then you have smoke filling in that region. But I'm going to address that in a second, and you'll see why that's not completely rational, what this fellow is saying, but let me get to it. Here's another one. This one says uh, that it uh, magnetic field, right, the threads there, the physical threads, right, they have ability to move a coil around. In fact, um, uh, Faraday discovered that a long time ago. Okay, so uh, he was astounded by that, okay? But yeah, the uh, field can interact with matter. Not all the matter that you would think in the way you think, but it does have ability of affecting matter, and especially gases. So for people to say, well, you know, a magnetic field cannot affect a gas. Yes, it can, okay? And so here's uh, the other issue that I raised for this. Uh, if you look at Quora, Tor tornadoes, right? And um, it says, um, pick up debris from the center and throw it outwards, ripping apart structures and scattering them. And another fellow says, tornadoes do not suck. There is no way you can be sucked into a tornado. What's the issue here? Well, if, if you saw the, the um, smoke going to the center of that rotating magnetic field, meaning the rotating threads that are in there, moving around. Well, in the same way, we, I, can, you know, I can play devil's advocate and say, well, why doesn't that kick the particles of smoke outwards? Why does it suck it in? I mean, after all, there are particles. This thing is swinging, right? And like a tornado, you know, I can just as well say that the effect that we should predict, right, is that all these particles are being hit like baseball uh, like a bat hitting baseball out of the ballpark, you know? So they're swinging around at great speeds. They should be hitting the particles outwards. Why did they suck them inwards? Okay, so that's the other thing you would have to explain, what the mechanism is there, okay? And that's where we take this fellow next. He says the following, he says, that uh, obviously has nothing to do with magnetism, and he continues, says, and everything to do with fluid mechanics. <laughs> like if he knew what fluid me mechanics was all about, okay? There's not one mathematician on earth that knows anything at all about fluid mechanics because they've never done it with objects. They've always done it with equations, okay? So they don't know the physics of fluid mechanics, and I'll get to that in a second now. You'll see why they have no clue whatsoever. And here you see it. He says, like a vacuum cleaner. See, a lot of these people, especially the flat earthers, right? They have this notion that... If you produce a vacuum, right, particles immediately rush in. 
And that's the notion all these people have in their tiny little brain between their ears. You produce a vacuum and particles rush in. Okay, what's the mechanism? How does vacuum pull on a particle? Or how does, when you create a vacuum, what pushes the particles into that space? I need to know the mechanism. I want you to tell me why a molecule. Don't tell me about you know the, the whole shebang. I just want one molecule. Okay, we produce a vacuum. Nothing there. Perfect vacuum, if you want. Why does that molecule move into that space? What pulls it in there? Why doesn't it go the other way? Okay, so uh, that's what we're going to talk about in a second. I'm going to give you a good example. It's going to blow them away. Clearly, there is some device rotating there on the right at very high rate. Yeah, it was the magnetic, the rotating magnetic field. I didn't say that it was rotating. I specifically left that out. I just wanted to make a point that a magnetic field, right, meaning the threads that are moving in there, they have a, uh, a uh, the power, the authority to interact with matter, with molecules of smoke, okay? And so he says there, this is, this is where, where we're going to get into in a second here. So there are gaps or holes within it for the air to get sucked in. He's going to talk about vacuum in. He's talking about sucked in. And he says, so the smoke drifts into the zone of lower pressure. Why? What's bringing, what's pulling from the vacuum uh, uh, this molecule that's now moving, drifting, you know, into the region of lower pressure? Why? What causes it to go there? See, these people just say things. They say, oh, I'm an expert in, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, uh, fluid dynamics, etc. Yeah. They know nothing. They know absolutely nothing about physics. They just read something about fluid dynamics. They say, well, we've observed that particles move in there. Yeah, they move in there. Why? What's causing it to move in there? Why don't you tell me the mechanism? And I'll give you an example here. Here's the example, okay? We have the Earth. And for those of you who are not flat earthers, the Earth is covered with air. That's what we breathe here, you know, and there's this layer of air that goes up several kilometers up in the sky, right? What continues is vacuum. At some point, you know, it gets uh, less dense, less dense, less dense. At some point, you know, somewhere between the uh, two stars, between the sun and Alpha Centauri, there's much less air there. And if we talk about between two galaxies, well, you know, there's almost no air whatsoever. So the farther out you go from the Earth, the less air you find, right? We find what we call vacuum. And let's just talk about perfect vacuum just for the sake of conversation. Let's assume that at some distance from the Earth, there's perfect vacuum, okay? So here it is, the picture, okay? We have vacuum up there, lower density, right? And higher density is right close to the Earth, to the surface of the Earth. Why doesn't the air molecule leave the earth and float into the vacuum if the vacuum pulls particles, if all particles, if all molecules of air drift into the region of vacuum? Here you have a vacuum. Why doesn't the air leave the earth? Okay, that's the question you have to answer. And these people just say, oh, it's the, you know, fluid flow, the flow flu, you know, and they talk about all this nonsense that they just learned by rote. They will not tell you the mechanism because not a single mathematician on earth can tell you the mechanism. And what they say here, well, the reason it doesn't leave the earth is because of gravity. Yeah, what is gravity? What's pulling on each molecule of air or atom of air or O2 or whatever you want to call it, I don't care. You know, what's pulling on it towards the Earth? Why doesn't it leave to the vacuum where you say that all particles tend to float towards? Okay? So that's the question, the million-dollar question in your hand. You're supposed to answer that question. Okay? And uh, final issue here, okay, and here it is. Uh, magnet, I showed that um, you can see that uh, the iron filings, these nuggets are collected one by one. You can say this is in slow motion. That's why we can see it. And you can see that the uh, iron filings, once the magnet is put into the water, into that uh, region, uh, suddenly they all start going towards the magnet little by little. 
If we did this in real time, like out here, well, what you would see is that suddenly, you know, you would see this. Suddenly, all the um, uh, nuggets uh, fall around the atom, uh, the magnet. So we would not be able to see the process. Here, you can see the process. It's a very slow process, and you can see something is moving around in that region we call field. We call them the threads that are moving around, and those threads are pulling one nugget at a time. Okay. So what does this fellow say? Okay, so we have an explanation. We're saying there's a physical thread that's swinging around many threads, gazillions of threads. They're going like that, and they're pulling one nugget at a time. And of course, uh, those threads have their origin in the magnet itself. So what happens at farther to the distance, the fewer threads you have, you know, intervening in the process, and at some point. You know, the, the nuggets are not picked up because the magnet is simply too far away. You would have to move the magnet closer to those nuggets so that some of the threads are closer and you can pick them up and put them next to the uh, magnet. Okay, so what does this fellow say? So we have a process. We have a mechanism. What does this uh, fellow say? Iron can be magnetized by a magnet. Hey, no kidding. I'm glad he learned that, okay? So what you, so how do you magnetize it? I mean, not how. What, what is the process? What does a magnet do to magnetize iron? That's what you need to find. And they give you this uh, general explanation. They say, well, the domains are aligned. Yeah, how, what's, what's affecting the domains? What physical entity is in contact with the domains? Unless you can tell me that, you know nothing about magnetization. You have to identify the objects, the things that are invisible and intangible to humans. So what you're seeing is a chain reaction of magnetization of those iron filings. Yeah, you haven't explained anything. Okay, all you're saying they're magnetized. Yeah, how did they get magnetized? What touched them? Okay, whatever is making those uh, 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 fillings fall in is running out of steam because it eventually grinds to a halt. Yeah, because of distance. But I'm glad he says whatever. Yeah, don't tell me whatever. You need to tell us the whatever is. What is that whatever? That's what you got to identify. Unless you identify the object, you're not doing physics. You're doing some nonsense there that you learned by rote. You're just repeating, regurgitating what they taught you by rote. No, you have to tell me what that whatever is. And that's what they never tell you. They never deal with objects. And when you put them there, you say, oh, you're doing word salad, Bill. You're doing semantics. No, no, we need to identify the objects in physics. Without objects, you cannot do physics. So if it we're perpetual jump ropes responsible, why do they run on a juice? Distance, very simple. It's, it's straightforward. I mean, and I've said that several times in many of my videos, but maybe this guy hasn't watched them. Do they get tangled up or something? No, they don't get tangled. There's no tangling between ropes or threads. Really, the threads in this case is the issue. Magnetism works with threads. A lot of people confuse rope with threads. Threads are not ropes, ropes are not threads. You have to keep those separate. Ropes are used for gravity, threads are used for magnetism. Keep those separate, never mix them, okay? Now it's because the influence, oh, we have the influence now, the whatevers and the influences of the magnet. Yeah, how does it influence? We need to know the object. Tell me the physical object and what it looks like and how it comes in contact with a magnet to magnetize it. That's what we need to know, that level of detail. Otherwise, you know nothing about physics or about magnetization. So don't boast about your ignorance, okay, especially on this channel, okay? Uh, so he continues, has spread to its maximum extent throughout the uh, uh, filings, and all these new uh, magnets have found equilibrium with each other. Yeah, he's just describing stuff. He hasn't explained absolutely anything. In order to explain, you need physical objects because you're explaining a mechanism, a cause. That's what we're looking at. So you need to tell us what came in contact with the iron filing to magnetize it. When the earth moves around, you know, the, the magnetic field of the earth, you know, all these threads that are moving around, but they call them field, okay? We'll use the word field if you want. How does it magnetize lodestone, for example? You know, you find a piece of lodestone that was made by the Earth's magnetic field. How did it do that? What came in contact with the rock that we call that piece of iron we call lodestone that is now magnetized? So you have to identify the physical objects, and it's very hard to let understand that for people to understand that. You can't do physics without objects. 